The Phantom Marine. In 1946, a Marine who was presumed dead appeared in his hometown in Arkansas out of thin air. Almost as quickly as he arrived, the mystery man vanished from the scene, never to be seen again. William Willard Langston grew up in the suburbs around Newport, Arkansas. After his high school graduation, Langston moved to Michigan, where he met, married, and had a child with Linda Schmeichel. In 1944, William was deployed to World War II as part of the Marine Corps. He was declared killed in action a year later on March 7, 1945, after participating in the Battle of Iwo Jima. But Langston's story did not end there. On January 19, 1946, an individual claiming to be William Willard Langston showed up in Newport, Arkansas. According to the soldier, he had arrived in Michigan first. After realizing his widow had remarried, he turned to his hometown. Langston had moved out of state 11 years prior, so the man was not immediately recognized by the locals. Still, old family friends and relatives who came into contact with him that day claimed he used old nicknames and recalled old stories that only the real William would know. One day later, the mysterious man left Newport without telling anybody where he was heading. The story of an Iwo Jima veteran returning from the dead and his subsequent disappearance was chronicled in newspapers from all over the country. During this time, Langston's mother received a letter claiming to be from him. In it, he wrote that he was headed to an Oklahoma veterans hospital and that he would get in touch with her later on. The alleged Langston also sent a letter to a local newspaper in which he complained about how unfair veterans were treated in the city and that he was moving on from his past. A few months later, the coverage stopped and internet searches shed no further light on the matter. Nobody knows where he went or why he only reappeared for a single day. More than 75 years later, the mystery of the Phantom Marine lingers on. Walter Dixon After a newlywed was declared dead in Korea, his wife had no choice but to move on. Little did she know that her husband was alive in a POW camp. Five days after getting married in 1950, Walter Dixon was deployed to Korea to serve in the Army's 38th Infantry Division. Dixon was supposed to come back to his wife after a year of combat, but one fateful day, Korean communists attacked the front line in which Dixon was collecting a debt from a fellow soldier. In May of 1951, Dixon's wife received a heartbreaking message. Her husband was dead. His obituary was even published in a local paper by an up-and-coming journalist. However, unbeknownst to Dixon's family and friends, the soldier was still alive behind enemy lines. When the communists attacked his post, Dixon witnessed five men from his unit get shot down by an artillery round. The soldier risked his life to help the injured men, carrying them one by one to a safe spot. He then made a makeshift tourniquet with his own jacket to assist with a leg injury. But before he could return to safety, Chinese troops supporting the North Koreans surrounded and captured him. The men Walter was helping were further attacked, and when fellow soldiers arrived at the scene, they spotted Dixon's jacket with letters from his wife, as well as his ID. He was subsequently declared as perished. However, for the next two and a half years, Dixon was actually a prisoner of war at a North Korean camp. He tried to escape five times and had to eat rats to survive. When the war ended, he was rescued by the Red Cross. Dixon finally returned home in 1953, and he was dismayed to find out that his wife had moved on and remarried. She also had a child, and Dixon granted her a divorce. Despite everything he went through, Dixon chose to stay with the army, eventually fighting in Vietnam and getting promoted to sergeant. As for that local obituary journalist, she and Dixon went on to marry and had three children together. Yoshio Yamakawa and Suzuki Nakauchi In 2005, two men claiming to be Japanese soldiers were found in the Philippines. According to them, they had been hiding in the jungle for over 60 years, waiting for the Second World War to end. During the fall of 2005, Mr. Terashima, a Japanese man from a veterans association that looks for Philippine soldiers' remains, was contacted by two men in their 80s who claimed to have lived on the island of Mindanao since the early 1940s. Unaware that the war ended 60 years prior, the men allegedly remained hidden in the jungle, 
afraid that they would be court-martialed for desertion and jailed for the rest of their lives. They both claimed to be members of a division whose ranks were devastated during the fierce battles against the United States in the final stages of World War II. Yoshio Yamakawa and Suzuki Nakauchi then wrote their names in Japanese, and Terashima immediately contacted the media and the embassy. After hearing the news, then Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi dispatched a team of diplomats to verify the men's identities and repatriate them. Terashima assured the Prime Minister's team that the men would show up in the island's capital the next day for tests. However, the veterans never showed up and presumably fled back into the mountains after getting upset with the presence of so many reporters and media in the area. According to embassy spokesman Shuhei Ogawa, this was not the first time a supposed Japanese soldier claimed to have been in hiding. Quote, we always have rumors about war veterans turning up alive in remote parts of the Philippines. This time the story seemed more credible. We had someone who promised us concrete information, a meeting on a certain day, so we took it more seriously. To this day, it is unknown what happened to the two men, and whether or not they were Japanese soldiers. Hiro Onoda On February 28, 1945, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi promised Lieutenant Hiro Onoda that, quote, It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we'll come back for you. Taniguchi kept his promise, but it took him almost 30 years to fulfill it. Hiro Onoda, born in 1922, graduated from Japan's top training center for military operations before joining the Japanese army in 1942. During the final stretch of World War II, Onoda and a small team were stationed in Lubang, a small island 93 miles southwest of Manila, where American forces landed in the area. Onoda's commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, gave his young lieutenant a final order, to stand and fight. He then assured Onoda that he would come back later to rescue him. Onoda and three other Japanese soldiers engaged in guerrilla warfare for months, fighting against locals and Americans. His loyalty was so fervent that when Japan surrendered in 1945, he refused to believe it, like many other Imperial soldiers. For three decades, Hiro Onoda and the three soldiers survived off bananas, coconuts, and stolen rice from nearby villages. The other soldiers either surrendered or perished during those years, and by the 1970s, Onoda was alone. The soldier was tracked down by Norio Suzuki, a Japanese student, in February of 1974. But even after being told the truth about the war, the now 52-year-old Onoda refused to surrender until he received official orders. A few months later, Suzuki returned with the Japanese delegation, Onoda's brother, and Major Taniguchi himself. After three decades on the run, Onoda tearfully surrendered his sword to Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos. Pardoned by the president for his crimes, the soldier returned to Japan. Although he was welcomed as a national hero, Onoda, an old-fashioned man, soon became disillusioned with the materialism and changes in Japanese society. A year later, Hiro Onoda moved to a Japanese colony in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to live a tranquil life raising cattle. In Brazil, he met and married Machine Onuku. The two later founded a survival skills youth camp in Japan. Alfred Jocelyn. Throughout World War I, households all across Europe feared that a telegraph or a knock at their door would deliver terrible news about members of their family fighting in the front lines. Many families went through needless heartbreak, as sons, brothers, and fathers were commonly reported dead when the men were very much alive. One of these survivors was Private Alfred Jocelyn, who was 19 when his mother was notified of his death due to enemy machine gunfire. Devastated, the Jocelyn family held a church service in the Essex village of Turling and mourned the soldier's loss. But not long after, his mother received a letter from the private, alive and well in a hospital in Malta. It so happened that Private Jocelyn was accidentally left for dead by a fellow soldier. According to Jocelyn's memoir, he was hit by a machine gun and thrown forcibly to the ground on his stomach. When another soldier spotted him, he left him for dead due to his extensive injuries. The next day, a lost British soldier heard the private scream for help and rescued him. His mother was shocked by the letter, mainly because the handwriting didn't match her son's. But Private Jocelyn had dictated these words to a nurse. Because of this technicality, the war office refused to acknowledge that he was alive. As soon as the injured soldier recovered from his injuries, he was sent back to fight in the front line and did not immediately return home to reunite with his family and friends. 
It wasn't until the war ended in 1918 that Private Jocelyn returned home and led a calm, happy life with his wife Mary and their four children. He lived to 95 years old. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to subscribe to this and our other Dark Documentaries channels. Hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content, and let us know in the comments about other topics you'd like to see us cover.